Hello and welcome. Our guest today is Professor Paul Krugman, Nobel laureate, noted commentator, and distinguished professor of economics at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Professor Krugman, welcome. Hi there. In recent years, we've seen a sharp deceleration of trade growth. And while the numbers for the past year have been better, uh, the trend over the last four or five years has been growth slowing, particularly in relation to overall economic expansion. To what do you attribute this? I actually think it's pretty benign. We don't know this for sure, but it doesn't look as if there's been a wave of protectionism. Um, you know, it's not the case that trade always has to grow faster than GDP. It, uh, it, it actually depends upon what well, the rate of technological progress is in transportation compared with the rate of technological progress elsewhere. And what we, the rapid trade growth that we became accustomed to was the combination of trade liberalization over the decades and then after about 1990, a burst of trade growth probably driven by uh, containerization, possibly uh, better telecommunications. You would expect that to be a one-time event. Now we have generally very liberal trade all around the world. We've pretty much exploited those technologies. It's no surprise and not a, not a thing to be worried about if trade growth slows to being no faster than or maybe even a bit slower than GDP growth. Okay. Even against this backdrop of slower trade growth, there are elements of public opinion that have reacted very negatively against trade um, and attributing, in fact, many of the lost manufacturing jobs to trade. For several decades now, you have taken another perspective on this. Um, that trade, in fact, was responsible for a small portion of the suppression of wages and jobs lost. Yes, in terms of jobs, manufacturing job loss, it's, you know, we can, we can do the counterfactual ask, what would happen if we just completely eliminated the U.S. trade deficit in manufacturing, uh, the U.S. being the place where this, this argument gets strongest? Um, and the answer is probably we would have a few more. We, we would have a manufacturing sector that was 10%, 15% larger than we now have, because that's roughly the scale of the trade deficit once you take into account the fact that it's not even a manufactured good has service uh, sector content. Mm -hmm. um, that would not be transformative. That would, not, that would bring us back just a few years in the terms of the long-term decline in manufacturing. It would not, not bring us back to the 60s, to the, that size manufacturing sector. So that's, that's pretty cut and dried. The impact on wages is a little bit less um, clear because there's some elements of, of trying to figure out how that works. And uh, the, uh, it, it's, it's a much tougher thing to try to estimate. Uh, um, there's, more, there's more assumptions, more modeling involved. Um, it's probably true that trade has contributed to rising inequality, that it has depressed wages for workers without a college education because we do tend to import, in advanced countries, we tend to import labor-intensive, less skill-intensive goods. Um, and the numbers there are probably bigger than they were in the 90s when this debate really first flared up. The world, you know, imports of manufactured goods from developing countries are now roughly three times as large relative to GDP as they were in 1990. So that's, uh, we're probably talking about a significant factor. It's still not the big story. The huge disjunction between productivity growth and wage growth, uh, you're going to explain only 15, 20% of that disjunction by, by looking at trade, but it, it's, it's significant. The point, however, is that, look, there are lots of factors in there. The, if we ask the, the general story about rising inequality and lagging wages, um, if you want to address that, there are a bunch of things you could do, and if you do those things, then there's no need to make trade a supervillain in the story. Is there a danger that policymakers will do just that, though, and impose some trade restrictions? There's a danger of trade restrictions, although I would say that on the whole, the trading system has been a lot more robust than you might have feared. I mean, when the 2008 crisis came, many people expected a, a 30s-style wave of protectionism, and that did not happen. And now, well, of course, we have a, we have a protectionist-sounding government in the United States, but it's kind of interesting that uh, as that started to become not just campaign rhetoric, but the possibility of concrete policy, 
Um, I think even the Trump administration became aware that, look, you know, there are a lot of American interests that are bound up with this integration. You know, they sort of said, well, you know, let's rip up NAFTA and U.S. manufacturing, U.S. agriculture said, you know, we've, we've invested heavily in the existence of this unified North American market. Uh, please don't do this. And you, know, you never know what they might do in the end, but it seems it, you know, breaking up is a lot harder to do than, than naive protectionists imagined it is. What about the role of technology, innovation? You mentioned higher productivity, uh, new production techniques. What's been the impact of this on employment in manufacturing? Oh, well, the key point about the long-term decline in manufacturing is that uh, productivity growth in manufacturing has been faster than productivity growth in other sectors. Um, not always, not every sector, but on the whole. Um, manufacturing is like agriculture. We, we, di we didn't stop eating, but we have almost no farmers because farming is so productive mm. that uh, we don't need, you know, we have fewer farmers in the United States now than we have people who play World of Warcraft. I mean, it's, uh, and manufacturing to some degree has gone in the same direction. We're, we still consume goods, we still want stuff, but we're mostly, we're able to produce that stuff with not very many workers, and um, which means that we shifted, you know, the, the big growth areas of employment are the things where technological progress has been the least. So uh, something like eight of the top, of the 10 fastest growing jobs in, in America are basically some form of nursing because face-to-face -face human contact is the thing that we still can't, uh, you know, can't mechanize. You know, it's very easy, of course, for s those of us who have jobs that have not been replaced, uh, particularly if we're getting to close to retirement age, uh, <laughs> to, to talk you know, philosophically about this. But um, uh, you have to bear in mind, this is a natural progression. It's a, as you get really good at doing something, you use fewer and fewer workers for it. And uh, so far, at least, we, we still have reasons to use workers for other things. What would be the best policy response to dealing with those who have been displaced? I mean, obviously, trade restrictions bring with it a whole lot of right. difficulties. What, what should governments do to address this problem, which does lead to quite a lot of disquiet in the, in the general public? There are two sorts of policies that I think help. Um, one of them is uh, conventional safety net policies. Very important to make sure that if, if jobs are displaced in an industry, that losing those jobs doesn't mean losing health care, doesn't mean losing your retirement benefits, doesn't mean um, that your children won't have adequate nutrition, all of these things. So uh, if we look at countries that have a relatively favorable view of trade, they tend to be countries that have a, a strong social safety net so that even if you do lose a job because of trade or anything else, um, the, it's not a catastrophe in terms of, of your basic welfare. Um, the other thing you can do is to try to ensure that the, the other jobs, as people move sectors, that the other jobs are also good jobs. Um, so in the United States, we have a situation where we think of good jobs with unions and good wages as being what manufacturing gives and, and that service jobs are poor jobs. But that doesn't have to be the case. You can do a lot. So again, you look at a place like Denmark, which has a, um, is wide open to global change, just like the United States, but has a, you know, a two thirds of its workforce is unionized. Mm. That's because at a crucial point, the United States made policy choices that led to a disintegration of unions. Denmark made policy choices that allowed them to continue. So um, in terms of the jargon of the people I work with now um, at the Stone Center at, at CUNY, um, we talk about there's both redistribution and pre-distribution. You can do things to make sure that wages are good in a wide range of sectors, and then you can do things that ensure that people have the basics even if their wages are not good. And how does the WTO and the trading system more generally factor into this? Should we be adapting in ways that can take into account this, this ever-changing dynamic? I think that the WTO, you know, the principal purpose of the WTO um, uh, and of the gap before it is, is still to provide a set of rules um, governing international commerce, which mostly have the effect of, I mean, the, the 
purpose of those rules. It's, it's a funny thing. We set up a system which is set up as if there were competition, there was a competition among countries of, of national interests clashing. But what those rules mostly really do is they actually protect each country from its own special interest groups. Yes, they do. And that's, you know, that's the purpose. And, and, and by the way, it works. I mean, international trade is one of the cleanest policy areas we have. You compare it with energy policy or agricultural policy or you know, anything else, it's, it's actually pretty good. Um, and that's still what you need to do. Now, I think there will be cases where there are potentially things that countries are trying to do to um, uh, make adjustment easier for its workers could run up against um, uh, trading rules. And I think the, this is where the WTO needs to be cognizant that, uh, that the goal is actually to not, the goal is to protect countries from their worst instincts, but not to prevent them from following their best instincts. So where if there are labor rules, if there are things that, that, um, that you're trying to negotiate that, that are worker enhancing, we should not allow um, a, a, a too strict interpretation of, of trade rules to, to stand in its way. And by the way, that goes even doubly for environmental issues. Uh, there is a possible at the moment, we, it, it's, it hasn't yet become an issue, partly because of um, uh, politics uh, is, is not prepared to do the things it should on environment. But, but uh, we certainly don't want uh, trade policy to be standing in the way of, of necessary environmental action. Paul Krugman, many thanks for joining us, and thanks to you for watching.